Welcome to the Opportunity Podcast, where entrepreneurs come to learn from real buyers, sellers, and industry experts on the lesser known growth opportunities to build their online business empires. We'll uncover tactics veteran online business entrepreneurs have used to build, buy, flip, and sell their way towards personal wealth. Sit back, grab a coffee, and get ready to uncover hidden growth secrets. The Opportunity Podcast starts now. Welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast, your go-to resource for hidden growth opportunities throughout online business. For those familiar new to the podcast, I'm Sarah, and thanks for joining me today. In this episode, Greg Alfrank, the Marketing Director at Empire Flippers, returns to the show to discuss the current state of the online business industry. He walks us through the events that impacted the industry this past year and what the current landscape looks like for buyers and sellers and the challenges that online entrepreneurs are facing. Don't worry, it's not all doom and gloom. Greg also reveals the opportunities that the current market presents for entrepreneurs, some tips and tricks on how to outlast your competitors, and some marketing quick wins that business owners can use to move the needle. We also discuss how to protect your business from Google algorithm updates and how AI will impact content creation moving forward. Keep listening until the end of the show because I have an exciting announcement to share and I won't ruin it. So just stay tuned and let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast. I am incredibly excited to be joined by today's guest, the one and only Gregory L. Frank, Director of Marketing at Empire Flippers. So Greg, thank you so much for coming on back, actually back onto the podcast today. I think today marks the third time I've been on this podcast. So I feel like I'm going to win the record of the most interviewed guest on here. I feel bad for you. God, you had to come back three times. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I guess since the last time you're on, maybe the world's looking a bit different. I don't know if you're in a different spot in the world. Where are you calling in from? Yeah, I think the last time we talked, I was in extremely cheap San Francisco, and now I'm in extremely expensive Saigon, Vietnam. So times have changed. <laughs> so you doubled your budget as soon as you went back to Vietnam then, I hope. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, you spend about 10 hours a day just buying banh mi's and pho and cafe suas. So like that takes up most of my time. But, you know, put in a little work here and there as well. I was about to say, I mean, I don't know how you fit in being a director of marketing at Empire Flippers when I have an idea of how much cafe suet you drink. And one, I don't know how you're alive. Two, wouldn't know how you have time even after that. So <laughs> your feet of nature, Greg. I'm drinking one right now, actually. <laughs> Actually, I would love one. I'm calling in from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I was just about to search for some Vietnamese coffee today. I woke up and I was just like, today is a Vietnamese coffee kind of day. So maybe that was just not even thinking about it, but knowing I'd be interviewing you later and jealous of your cafe sua. <laughs> the cosmos beckons you. It did. <laughs> you must drink Vietnamese coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Vietnamese coffee aside, we've got a bunch of things to go over today. Kind of an assortment of things, maybe just obviously catching up with you since you were in super cheap San Francisco, but also catching up at the industry at large and wanted to finally pick your brain on kind of general kind of marketing let's say your marketing prowess, if you will, because we've got a lot of people calling in and I've been noticing that we're getting lots of questions. You're basically a YouTube celebrity at this point. <laughs> Not forever. We have uh, an exciting announcement there with one of our content specialists, Nick. He'll likely be taking over that whole channel here soon. So soon there shall be a new celebrity. <laughs> Absolutely. So someone's going to take your throne and then just catapult to the top of the charts, Nick G. So everyone make sure to check out Nick's new YouTube content. But yeah, we're basically going to be catching up on a lot of different things today, probably having some fun along the way. So this should be a fun episode. So let's kick it off. Let's get started. Obviously, a lot of things have changed since we last talked. And we know this year in particular has been crazy because somehow things managed to get even crazier in 2022. <laughs> I was wondering if you could walk us through the events that might have impacted the online business industry in 2022. What has happened there? Sure. Like if you're in the news business, this has been a great last few months for you. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of stuff happening. As most people in our audience, or maybe not, maybe they don't know, the aggregators are imploding across the landscape. The FBA aggregators in throughout like 2020 through 21, they raised literally hundreds of millions of dollars, like a few of these companies worth billions. And now we're seeing them laying people off, right? 
And this is actually like something I often advise entrepreneurs to don't do this, but they want to do it anyways, which is just be obsessed with growth and growth at all costs. And these aggregators, very smart people, a lot of them played themselves into that narrative of growth. And they are so levered up with debt and equity, all sorts of stuff from their capital raising that a lot of them now with what I'm about to talk about is destroying them. And the thing that happened there is basically the public market. So like the stock market, for example, huge hits as inflations rise, concerns with supply chain, concerns with you know the ongoing war in Ukraine. All this kind of stuff is creating this huge ripple effect. I and mean, you ever see the public stock market like take a gut punch like this? The private capital markets, they're basically just had their legs severed because whatever happens to the public markets is like five, 10 times worse than the private markets typically. And unfortunately, these aggregators and other big players who did raise money, they're not like a GameStop that can like count on a bunch of Reddit memesters to lift up their valuation. It doesn't work that way in the private market. So they don't have that same kind of hype train to uh, really recoup that capital that they need for growth. And so a lot of them, when you combine that with capital just drying up that they can't raise more and with the fact that so many of the businesses that they were buying were more expensive due to demand, you get this very interesting storm that is happening. And then there's the other thing that has happened to the aggregators, which a lot of them realize they're very good at raising money. They're very good at M&A and very bad at running FBA businesses. <laughs> so there is that aspect, too, which I've often talked about, which, you know, some of these aggregators, they come from more of a M&A finance background, which is cool. It's great. They it helps them get really good deals. They make really good deal structures, fantastic buyers, but maybe not the best actual operator. They don't have that same kind of grit as a bootstrap entrepreneur, like the seller that built that business to, to really go and go forth and become bigger. So you're seeing all of this and the layoffs that are happening in the aggregator space is not just tied to the aggregator space. Like if you look at the tech space, basically any of the tech companies that were raising a lot of money for growth are in very similar positions right now. But I think with the aggregators is especially interesting because they treated them so much like a tech company, like a tech startup. In fact, that is often one of their marketing messages. But at the end of the day, they're really not a tech startup. They're an e-commerce store, right? They're an e-commerce brand. And they're selling physical products, not uh, you know some of super high margins, say like uh, software. So you have this confluence of events and these people are starting to kind of collapse. Like we've seen aggregators sell off some of their assets to other aggregators. So this is causing a bit of a collapse on the buy side of the market. There's still tons of people want to sell. We're like, I think the last two or three weeks, we've had some of our highest listings that we've published on the marketplace in a long time. So like the seller side is still there. The supply is still there. But we're seeing as 2022 moves into uh, the latter half of the year that the demand, the acquisition demand for seven figure and up isn't as hungry as it once was. So I think we're seeing the bubble of acquisition starting to pop. Yeah, you just use terms like gut punch, severed legs, <laughs> and like, to me, the poeticness to it. <laughs> yeah, the poeticness. When you describe all that, and to me, it sounds a little bit like mayhem. And I know it's mayhem on, I guess, specific subset buyers. I mean, I'm curious where the silver linings are in all that, if any. Yeah, I mean, well, like. There is a lot of opportunity in doom and gloom when the clouds are all stormy. Everyone gets scared, runs back into the building. If you stay out in the rain, you're going to figure out you know, how to build a better mousetrap, right? So there's definitely opportunities here. On the buy side, the opportunity is quite clear. The competition for businesses to acquire businesses, especially in the seven figure and up range, just got slashed, right? We talk about the severed legs slashed at the knee, right? So the buyer who is not the aggregator, who's been more conservative with their capital or an aggregator that has been conservative, because there are a few that I'm friends with that they've been very conservative over the last two years. They didn't like jump into the hype train like a lot of the others did. And they're doing great. So not all aggregators are you know screwed. A lot of them are actually still doing well, the ones that really manage their capital good. But for buyers, the competition is going to be lower. So there's a better chance you can get a better deal for a better business. So that is a big silver lining because the last two years has been so hyper competitive. Like if you're looking to buy uh, businesses over seven figures, you're often competing against like five to 10 other people who are just as well-funded as you or even more. And if you didn't raise capital, you were at a super disadvantage because 
you're just not going to be able to beat some of these people that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars that they can deploy, right? So that's some of the silver lining. So some of the more Main Street buyers are going to stand a chance at getting these bigger businesses and maybe even get better deals because as demand falls, they're less competitive. You could probably make offers that you just couldn't make back in 2020 to 2021. And, you know, it's kind of what we talked about the last time about the season of the seller. Now I think we're starting to move back into a season of the buyer. Well, yeah, because I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, Susan Seller has been such a big theme of you know what we've been talking about the past couple of years at EF. It's such a special time for sellers to come in and make these absolutely incredible exits thanks to the state of the market. I mean, we're talking a lot about what's changing on the buyer side, but I think it's worth getting into what the landscape looks like for sellers. And, you know, are there still some silver linings for them? Is Are there still some benefits that they could be taken advantage of? Or do they need to have a completely different headspace when it comes to exiting right now? Unfortunately, this storm particularly affects sellers, right? There's not as many silver linings going on for them. Now, I'm not saying you can't sell. You definitely can. We're still selling businesses, right? Every single week we're selling businesses. But it is harder. So what could have sold easily is a mid of 2021 may not even have a chance now just because of the way that the buyer ecosystem is at. Now, if you have a high quality business, then you're most likely still going to sell. So what I would tell sellers, the main thing to focus on during this time of tumultuousness is quality brands, quality products, and a quality, well-ran business. Those three things, I mean, even good times that you want that, but heading into recession times, like as everyone's fearing that we're going to do, that is super important, right? Like the other thing is you probably, if you want to sell your business, you're going to have to be more open-minded in terms of flexibility before you could be able to just like negotiate above list price all day long. Now that's not particularly gone away just yet, but there is a chance that will go away And so sellers who are too rigid in what they will or will not allow may end up just not getting a deal, which might be fine for that seller, right? Depending on what they want, but the rigidity might actually prevent them from making a deal happen now. So that's a thing to keep in mind. The other thing, this is kind of a silver lining. So for sellers, not particularly in selling their business, but in running of the business in general, if you've been a good manager of your own capital as you've been growing the business and didn't give into the great fool's quest of growth that every entrepreneur gets charmed by and you're sitting on good liquidity, then you're in a very good position right now because a lot of your competitors most likely aren't. They most likely did give into the fool's quest of growth at all costs, and they're probably in a thinner position than they would like. So what you'll see is a lot of businesses start closing doors, like this folding, like Now that the COVID bump, as a lot of my e-commerce friends call it, it, is going away and people are starting to shop offline again and just less traffic coming than what we saw at the height of the pandemic, some of these newer businesses, they got too used to that. And now they don't know how to operate at thinner operations, thinner margins, all that kind of stuff. So the silver lining there for the entrepreneur, you might have less competitors, which also means you can probably grow the business be a lot bigger than what it was before. The space will get less noisy, which is always good for the entrepreneur building the business. And ultimately, that could lead to a much bigger valuation too down the road as you take over that market share that the other sellers are like kind of throwing in the towel have given up. Yeah. You know, I was speaking to a couple of people recently, and it sounds like as scary as recessions are, or potential recessions you know, it is a good time to bolster your business. There is room for opportunity, like everything you spelled out. And I mean, there are some people that built the business of their dreams because of the recession. Like you said, the competition cleared out, they were able to build something really strong. Lo and behold, a few years later, when things are back to being booming, they're already leading the space. I like what you said about, you know, growth and repositioning how you were approaching growth or making sure that you got those capital reserves. Cause I think you and I, Greg, have talked a lot about, you know, how do you prepare for the worst of times? And we have talked a little bit about like having a bunker mentality, if you will, which isn't always a bad thing. But it could be that those who have businesses that are doing well right now, it's like that repositioning of, okay, here's what I do to strengthen, strengthen, improve upon my business versus say rushing to sell. Like I might've, you know, six months a year ago thinking it's my only chance. And, you know, if the right buyers aren't there or I could just be building the business, 
I might be in a better position to hold on, continue to strengthen the hell out of it versus just kind of running and selling it at not the right time. This could be the thing that carries me through the pandemic. This could be the thing that with a little bit more time and energy spent on it, all of a sudden I could dominate the market in a new way. And I think it just, it's a matter of mind shift, which, you know, maybe some people are ready for, maybe they're not, but I still think there's some like good advice in that mind shift and everything that you just spelled out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it's a bit scary out there for sure with everything that's going on. But if you look at the long arc of history of businesses that are household names today, like a lot of them started in recessions. A lot of them started in bad times. In fact, a lot of businesses start out of the necessity because of bad times. I have a a friend, he left the company he worked for right as the pandemic began. Like no one knew what was going to happen. No one knew what this was. He's like, oh shit, I just made a terrible decision. And like he crushed it. He crushed it for the last two years. He did a really crazy job. And that was kind of born out of the necessity of where he was. So a lot of times swimming into troubled territory of waters unknown often leads to the treasure, right? Like if you look at the treasure map, like on any pirate map, there's always like, here be monsters. And by the way, there's like a crap load of treasure here if you kill the monsters. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you always got to go there to get the treasure, right? Every game, you got to like get the boss to get the treasure. So what I'm saying is like in these troubled times, it can feel pretty dark, moody, all that kind of stuff. But often this is where the true gold is made, where the sword is forged with the hot steel, right? And as these other companies kind of will, because they don't know how to respond, other companies will come rushing in and just crush it. And like from my own experience in marketing, this isn't necessarily related to the economy, but like just in Google SEO, you know, like that's kind of like my big background in marketing. And I've been doing it for, I don't know, seven, maybe nine years at this point. And I have read so many articles from influencers who were really big in their day in the SEO where a Google algorithm update happens and they're just like, SEO is dead, hair on fire, you know, give up. Affiliate marketing is dead. Dropshipping is dead. All this stuff is dead all the time. There was this guy who actually charted how many times someone has said SEO is dead. It was like in the hundreds, like on like real publications, <laughs> you know, but yeah. I'm fairly yeah, really certain I saw an article like that yesterday. <laughs> so, exactly. And the newest version, right? This, by the way, is a, one of the big reasons why your competitors will wilt and kind of die off. Like they might still be profitable when they die off. They get in this mindset where it's just all is lost. Woe is me. I'm throwing in the towel before I lose everything, right? They're not even thinking about solutions. So the entrepreneur that keeps thinking about solutions of how to overcome this adversity, how to operate more efficiently, leaner, and with a realistic set of growth goals, not some growth goal that's like pie in the sky, that'd be real nice, but really grounded growth goals and understanding your costs, all that kind of stuff. And you'll probably do fine. Like I said, a lot of businesses are born out of this kind of necessity, this risky waters that people swim in. Well, I'm glad that you started talking about SEO because that was one thing that I had on my mind is we're just talking about state of the industry and everything going on. There's the other side of that, which is kind of what's going on in the land of Google, what's going on for people that rely on algorithms to kind of keep up and running. And we know like a lot of affiliate businesses, content businesses will be impacted by what's going on with Google. So obviously everybody, them in particular. So I'm curious, like, Anything going on there that you want to talk about and maybe dispel any sort of thoughts that might be on the minds of entrepreneurs? Sure. So the algorithm is always a moving target. So I'll I'll give my little spiel I always give about entrepreneurship. A lot of people start a business to quit their job, right? To like, I'm going to be my own boss, but they never realize that the algorithm becomes their boss. (laughs) They're way (laughs) crueler than your previous boss was likely. Like I worked in the oil fields. I had some pretty cruel bosses, but Google is a very cruel boss. (laughs) It just does not (laughs) care. So like, I will always give this advice when asked about this type of thing. Like the number one thing you can do as an entrepreneur is to build an audience you retain. So if you're building an affiliate site, building an e-commerce store, whatever, build an email list. That is your number one asset that the algorithms cannot do anything about. So that's my soapbox on that. But in terms of what Google's trying to do, this recent update is quite funny. So they've been targeting like AI content, AI driven content. So I have a friend, he has about like his content site is probably worth around $5 million. 
and he got destroyed in this update. And it's ironic because he has no AI content on his site. He actually has high paid like niche expert writers writing all this stuff. <laughs> so he's like, what the hell? And then I have friends who have just crazy spammy AI websites that are crushing it after the update. I actually heard a rumor. I was talking to Justin Cook, you know, our CMO, co-founder uh, about this. I didn't know about this until yesterday, but he said that they rolled the algorithm back a little bit, which is interesting because I wonder if they rolled it back because Google, like, frankly, doesn't know what is AI or not AI content. And to clarify, sorry to cut in. So yeah. the algorithm update, well, we all don't know for sure what they're targeting, but it's understood that it was trying to crush AI content, bad AI yeah. content. Okay. Yep. It's trying to crush all of that. And it's ironic because Google built the AI that these SEOs are using as GPT-2, <laughs> GPT-3. So they're like accidentally creating their own demons once more. <laughs> Interesting. I love yeah. it. So like if you look at all the AI tools like uh, Jasper, Word, I think one's called Word Hero, but pretty much all of them are using GPT-3, which is Google's <laughs> AI <Yeah>. language processor. <laughs> Incredible. Okay. So, you know, now they've rolled it back and you're hearing this ripple effect across the industry that some people, let's say, did the right thing. I don't think there's really like a right or wrong thing here, but they had the niche experts come in, they got crushed. And then people that went kind of more low quality AI, they're being lifted, but there seems to be like the tides evening out and people are starting to see improvements. So, yeah, I think I haven't dug into this yet. So this might be totally unfounded, but just having that conversation yesterday, I think if they did roll back the algorithm, it's probably Google like throwing their own hands up like, oh, my God, we don't know what is AI. <laughs> we don't know what is AI or not AI, but we're getting all this bad feedback. I think we messed up. So that's probably why they rolled back to try to figure it out better. I know they can mostly see GBT2. I don't know about GBT3. I think they're getting better at it. But of course, GBT4 is about to come out. So like all that's going to be for not. But yeah, so my friend's sites are probably going to recover. I mean, the algorithm update only stopped, I think, about a week ago as the time at the time of this recording. And usually you don't really want to mess with your site for two to three weeks after an algo update just to see where you settle. Because that first week is like Google is just shuffling everything around to see what works and what doesn't. And they're looking at engagement, like click-through rates to links, all that kind of stuff, I'll like on the actual search results to see like what people like, to see if their algorithm worked, right? So we'll see. My friend who got hit, the guy with the $5 million content site, he thinks he's fixed it, but he won't know for a month, <laughs> you know, wow. which is very SEO, like it takes forever. Well, I wanted to talk to you about that because, you know, wanted to dig in and pick your brain on a bunch of different marketing things. But that was one topic that I want to talk about because AI seems to be the growing whispers throughout the industry when it comes to creating content for, you know, all kinds of sites online, all kinds of businesses. But it seems like we have this large degree of just unknown when it comes to dealing with AI. Is it good? Is it going to hurt sites? Is it like the way of the future? Will writers be replaced? I think there's excitement and yet fear mixed in and nobody seems to know what to do with this like hot rock they're trying to hold on to and yet pass along to everyone else when it starts going bad. So, I mean, I'm curious from your perspective, like what's your take on AI and how it's going to impact content creation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really cool. And I'm a writer saying that, like, I love writing mm -hmm. and creating content. I think if you go into it using AI, like my spammy friends, you're never going to build something quality because they're just like, yeah, give me 20,000 words. Like, great, publish it. Like, you know, that kind of content usually tends to be pretty crap, pretty low quality. But you, there are ways to use AI where it can augment you. I think the best use case in terms of a content creator, like let's say you wanted to start a blog on a topic you're very passionate about, you know a lot about. You could use AI to create outline for you super quick, to write intros, to write some of the paragraphs in your outline. You already know what it is. You can like you understand what you're talking about. You can fact check that very quickly versus someone who doesn't know like that pro might not be a good move for them. Or if you're a fast writer, it might not be a good move for them. But if you're a slow writer, you know your niche, then the AI can be an awesome augmentation tool for you to speed up your writing. I'm a very fast writer. So whenever I use an AI writing tool, I tend to find it to be 
like kind of slows me down a lot, which might be just me not using it as effectively as possible. But you really need to approach it with frameworks that feed it in the right way. It's almost like you're collaborating. Like, so don't view it as it's writing it for you. You're like collaborating with this artificial intelligence on the article. Like, just like how you do, sir, when you're like editing one of our writer's pieces, right? It's very similar. Of course, the feedback is instant, of course. And you have to guide it throughout the whole process. It does save time, again, if you're a slow writer, so that's good. Some of the other things that you can do with AI that I find very interesting isn't necessarily just writing out your blog post, but helping you with like copywriting, like as an ideas generator. There's like some that give you those like wacky marketing ideas. And sometimes they're actually like funny and also quite good. So it gets the juices kind of going uh, And a lot of them, they're trained up on general copywriting principles like ADA or PASS. That can help you a lot. Like say you're running Facebook ads and you want to test out like a hundred different ones. AI can like crush that for you. So you edit it a little bit, but you can crank out tons of those stuff. So it's not just like blog posts and SEO writing where AI can benefit. There's all this other stuff that's happening. I think one thing that's really fascinating in AI is voice AI. So there's a tool called Descript that I've recently like been nerding out about just like looking at. And you can literally edit a podcast or video like you would with a Google Doc. So if I called you, I don't know, Jolene instead of Sarah, and we wanted to edit that out, like, oh, Greg's an idiot. I can't believe you said Jolene. Then we <laughs> literally delete where I said Jolene because it will show up as a transcript automatically using their AI and say, Sarah. And because it creates a voice model of my voice as it's hearing the recording, Suddenly, it's just like I said, Sarah, which is you know scary from a deep fake perspective, but from a like editing perspective, I think that is really fascinating and very very cool. How good these like voice modeling AI stuff is getting. So there's a bunch of cool stuff coming out, but yeah, it's a hit or miss. It's not like a hundred percent win. I think there is a lot of big future involved with AI. It's not fully there. You can't like just let it do its thing unless you want a very weird website, but it can be quite helpful. Greg, you better not ever call me Jolene without at least accompanying that with a song, Jolene. Like, if I don't get a musical with that, I'm going to be upset. Oh, you will have to be a part of my Patreon to get the musical. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with you for how many years and you've never sung for me? Like, <laughs> You're really focusing in on your YouTubing, your writing, but you haven't even done like name-based musical bust outs here. So... I've been so lazy on the musical operatic side of my personality lately. <laughs> so lazy. Speaking of, well, you know, let's talk about some things you're not lazy on, which seems to be marketing, except, you know, how you're fitting it in between this Cafe Suez. I have no idea. I wanted to pick your brain on this because I know these are some of your favorite topics and just things that you love to nerd out over. So understanding you've been around the marketing industry for a number of years since you found your way out of the oil fields and into the even crazier world of online marketing. I'm curious, what is the last clever marketing strategy you came across that genuinely surprised you? So there was something actually pretty recently, like I think it was three weeks ago, and it's just a small hack and it's probably going to go away the way you can do this, but you can still use it in a more you know sensible way. So I knew this guy is following on social media and what he would do, it was on uh, YouTube, he would take these TikTok videos and then upload them to YouTube, like YouTube shorts. And he would just like credit back the TikTok influencer or whatever. Like by doing that, since YouTube is promoting shorts so hardcore, like he would get thousands of views in like 30 minutes or like 10 minutes worth of work. Now, it's a pretty crappy strategy because it's like really hard to monetize and all that stuff. But I found it very fascinating because I've been trying to wrap my head around like how does short form video work with longer form video? Like how can you kind of use both? It made me realize like, wait a second. So if you have like, say a show kind of like this, but it would have to be structured a little bit differently. If you had a show that you're doing like this kind of master show and we repurpose content, you and I both know what a pain in the butt that can be at times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but if you have like a whole streamlined service, streamlined thing, like using the script or something where you can like quickly pull something out, uh, you can use this YouTube short and TikTok strategy where they're just giving you so much reach. And I think Instagram Reels does the same thing, though I haven't heard much about them yet, where it gives you so much reach, you can actually use it as kind of a traffic accelerant to your actual long form stuff. So like, 
say we had structure to the show, like here's the three things you need to know, right? And we're on video or whatever, or you don't even need to be on video. You can just put like text overlay with Canva or something. And you can upload those like three bullet points to your TikTok, to your YouTube shorts, your Instagram reels. And of course, with a call to action, like go here to like listen to the whole show. I think you could probably bang out some crazy traffic numbers right now with how much they're like the shorts are battling each other right now, like between TikTok, uh, Instagram and YouTube. Like that could be a very impressive way to build up a huge audience quite quickly. And if the listener out there wants to do it, you should do it now because usually these opportunities only last for a few months before it becomes saturated. And then they're like, hey, you should buy an ad to promote this short. (laughs) (laughs) So if you want the free organic traffic, you got to hop onto it now. But remember, if you do it, build a list because that trick will probably close. I feel like you need to be Gregory build a list Elf Frank. <laughs> if I can say that <laughs> correct. Like, what would your middle name, your like tagline be? I feel like it's a build a list, but it's a good one. And you're right on that. You just said something really interesting that caught my attention. You're talking about this problem with saturation and getting in quick, diving in on opportunities while they present themselves because they don't last as long as you think they would in the online space. And so For me, I was wondering beyond saturation, what are some of the other marketing challenges that online businesses are facing at this particular moment? Yeah, well, saturation is always an issue and also not an issue. So I want to be clear on that. Some people never get started because they think, oh, it's oversaturated. Like I've had friends who are like really passionate about becoming a graphic designer and they didn't because they thought it was oversaturated. Yet there's hundreds, if not thousands of graphic designers getting six figure jobs every year who are like just starting out or very small portfolio. So like, I want to be clear, just because something is saturated doesn't mean you can't succeed. There's always ways to cut through the noise and be better. So when things start to get crowded, you got to really focus on quality, right? Quality and maybe also niche, right? Because we know that, yeah. okay, you can be the graphic designer, but if you're doing the graphic design for X industry that is underserved, same thing with writing, right? It's why niching down in your service or even in your online business matters. So there's Absolutely. always an opportunity when you find that white space. Uh, like if you want to become a marketing agency, don't go to the chiropractor. Everyone goes to chiropractors and dentists. Maybe you go to like the guy that sells a uh, mobile homes, you know, like something like that. That's like really random. And by doing that, you'll probably get paid better. <laughs> but yeah. There's also that factor too. <laughs> I met a writer who got off the ground fairly fast, but writing for casinos. That blew my mind. How did you find casinos? You know, they were like, it's extremely lucrative. (laughs) I mean, people, you know, who else is writing for the casinos? They need uh, specific writers who can write their content. Lo and behold, they're doing super well for themselves. So I was like, there you go. Find the opportunities. They exist. Yeah, absolutely. Niching down is always a profitable thing. In terms of other things that I think entrepreneurs are facing, it's like, Nothing has necessarily changed. Like I've been around for long enough to see the ways and the winds of tactics change and evolve and, you know, form into new faces. And some people love it. Some people hate it. But it's all the same stuff at the end of the day. Like in marketing, it always comes down to, you know, what kind of pain am I solving? What kind of pleasure am I giving? Like what kind of transformation am I offering my audience by using my products or services or reading my content? Right. Like it's always the same thing, regardless of the channel. Each channel has its own like specific way of conveying that the best. So you have to study how to do that. I think most entrepreneurs and me included, when I look at a new channels, sometimes we don't really do the research. Or like, okay, who's like the top 100 people on the social media channel in my niche? And what are they doing? You know, like to model off of that. I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with doing that. And that kind of like hurts their growth. They're like, ah, oh, this doesn't work. And then meanwhile, their competitors just like killing it. <laughs> but yeah, so like a lot of the struggles that online business owners are facing about the same kind of struggles that they were facing two, three, four, five years ago. Like I said earlier, things look a little bit gloomier today than maybe they did two years ago, but the struggle is the same, right? How do I grow efficiently? How do I delegate? How do I build a team? How do I make my business a machine of leverage, right? All these questions remain exactly the same, and they're the exact same challenges that entrepreneurs have now that they had a year ago. They might look like the variables within those challenges have changed a little bit, but not by a much in my view. So a lot of the same kind of struggles, which might be good news or bad news, depending on where you are on the fight. <laughs> on the fight. Well, I think based off everything you just said, my next question might be a contentious one. So feel free to go off, if you will, if this is not something that sits well with you. <laughs> Can't wait. Spicy. Okay, so would you say there are any marketing quick wins 
that entrepreneurs can use to boost their brand awareness or do quick wins not really exist in marketing? Quick wins do exist. You got to be careful with them because what often is advertised as a quick win is a long, painful <laughs> thing. <advertised laughs> nice fall into doom yeah. and despair, leg severing. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. People talk about like, oh, it's so easy to repurpose content. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, not if you yep. wanted to make it work good. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, you know, if you always do that, oh, this is so quick win. You'll multiply the life shelf of your content. Like, yeah. You know, if I'm Gary V and I have like a film crew I'm paying like 100 grand a month for, maybe <laughs> like all the social media. Lots of people to overwork. Yeah. yeah. So uh, a lot of times what is advertised as a quick win in marketing really isn't. And most of the time what is advertised as like, oh, you should definitely do this. It would, like they're selling you the dream of it. And then you do it and like it might be effective, but nowhere near as effective as they said. <laughs> like that's usually kind of the case. So I like, you know, this, Sarah, I tell the team, whenever you see something going really well, that's a red flag that something's broken. <laughs> like, we need to look into like, what's going on here. So I am a marketer. I still am extremely passionate about marketing, but I trust zero tools. Like I look at mm. all the tools and I cross and compare them to see like, are they telling me the truth or are they like trolling me? You know, is HubSpot trolling me today, which HubSpot has trolled me many times. Like one time they told me I did a $23 million webinar. Like that's definitely wrong, HubSpot. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely <laughs> false. <laughs> Shoot for the stars, Greg. Yeah. Believe anything's possible. You know, close in eight figures in a half hour webinar. <laughs> no big deal. You're uh, just like, that good. People can't even go through a vetting process in like less than a week, you know? <laughs> so it's <was> like completely <laughs> just so wrong. But yeah, so there are actual quick wins. There are things I would say focus on. Uh, conversion rate optimization is one of the biggest quick wins just from a pure traffic to customer standpoint. Like we've done conversion rate optimization on our valuation tool. I think this was probably like three and a half, maybe even four years ago. And that led to us effectively doubling our lead flow with the same amount of traffic hitting those pages. So CRO, don't sit on that. Conversion rate optimization is huge. If you don't want to do it, you can always hire an agency to do it for you. But that is one of the quickest wins. And it usually it doesn't always work, but when it does, it can be huge. And you're already getting the traffic anyway. So none of that uh, variable is changing there. The other thing, if uh, your business is using SEO, I highly recommend going through your blogs, all your content, probably like maybe once every two quarters. You don't want to do it like too often because then you're just always updating old content. But there's often a lot of quick wins you can get from on-page optimization. Like we recently did some like tweaking of our valuation tool content and our SEO traffic shot up, I think it was by 123%, something like that, 140%. And our leads also shot up from organic traffic. And that's a landing page. Like there's not even really any content on that page, right? It's a landing page, squeeze page. But we have so many backlinks going to it. And I was just trawling through Ahrefs, like, you know, moseying along, like, hey, that's an interesting keyword. I wonder if we have that on that page. Oh, we don't. We should definitely do that. <laughs> so we added like 20 keywords on there. And it took us like a week to get this huge win, right? And like we sell, I think our average size of our business is still around like five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000. And that's a pretty good return on investment for what is effectively like an hour's worth of work and then waiting around for a couple of weeks <laughs> with it. So like not bad. So there are actual quick wins you can do in terms of brand awareness. If you want to grow your audience bigger, I think using something like the short strategy as a traffic accelerant that I mentioned earlier is really big right now. You know, if you can make it, just pump out a bunch of 20, 60 second videos and pump them out through all the different short video platforms right now, you're going to see a huge boon of traffic. And as long as you focus on building the email list, there it comes again then you'll be able to hold on to that win because that will probably go away, right? So those are some quick wins you can do. There's definitely things you can do, but always go into knowing most quick wins are advertised, probably won't work as well as people say they are, and usually are harder to do than people let on as well. <laughs> I guess this is in a similar vein. This is a question I really like to ask SEOs. I love to get anyone and everyone on in the SEO space and just tell me, say, Hey, what's bullshit in the industry? You know, what is a nonsensical thing that people are told to do in the industry that you just wish didn't exist? And I think the same exists for marketing. So if we could talk about that question in, in light of, let's say future proofing your marketing strategy and what should people be aware of for the future 
in terms of what is say BS advice right now, don't listen to this, do that to really succeed in the coming months, the coming years, what would it be? So I've been pretty active on LinkedIn for the last, I don't know, year and a half, two years. And I've become friends with a lot of B2B marketers on there. And there's so much garbage they post. Like there's, <laughs> there's this one where the guy was like, he had a big following and people loved it for some reason. He was like, marketing is not about convincing. It's about persuading people. Like, man, those are literally sentiments. Like, what are you talking about? That's the same thing. <laughs> like, so there's all sorts of bad advice and platitudes that go like yep. so much so like i've been thinking about like starting a spreadsheet of just like all the bad sayings i hear marketers say they're just like absolutely ridiculous oh and please just, like, please do this yeah like like create like a shopify print on the venture like stupid shit marketers say.com <laughs> so like, i think it'd be hilarious but it goes well with my personality I'm always like loving controlling <laughs> Uh, but in terms of actual bad advice out there, and this is bad advice in my view that comes off sounding like good advice on the surface, and it can be good advice. This is like one of those weird nuanced things, but that's becoming a slave to attribution and KPIs. Like I see that so often, and especially if you're focused on brand awareness, like this could be even worse for you. So I see a lot of marketers and a lot of entrepreneurs where they need to know where every single dollar goes and what kind of ROI that produces. Now, that sounds reasonable, right? But there's a big problem here. Even Google, that has spent probably at this point billions of dollars, has not figured out attribution very well. And now we have the iOS update that's coming on that has been causing all sorts of interesting mayhem. Oddly enough, my ads I get targeted to on Facebook are more targeted to me now than they were before. Like you're getting hit up about becoming a professional dungeon master. Like this is so oddly specific. <laughs> like how do you know I play d and <laughs> Because I opted out of the tracking too. So like with the iOS update, I opted out. So it's like, how is this even more targeted towards me? <laughs> so you just had all the like, criteria even before you opted out. They just knew. Yeah, Just yeah. Check I mean, boxes doing, were there. They're doing all that data modeling, right? But yep. the point is like attribution is such a hard thing that the, literally the richest companies in the history of humanity have not solved. So right there, that tells you there's no such thing as 100% attribution. If you have a long sales cycle like we do, so our sales cycle is like over 200 days, you might as well throw attribution mostly out of the window because it's extremely hard. And when you do figure out something, it's like, not very useful to like help you with marketing. Like all the marketers think like, oh, if I only knew my attribution, then I could do so much more. And then they find out like, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to run a Facebook ad. Then they're going to Google you. They're going to get land on this keyword. They're going to join your email list. They're going to listen to five podcasts from opening up four different emails. And then they're going to register an account. They're going to have like two, three meetings with your salespeople. And then they're going to buy. And this is your best customer ever. And by the way, it's one person. Good luck modeling that. <laughs> Good luck scaling <laughs> using any of that data for anything useful, right? So there's this trap that marketers and entrepreneurs fall into. Like, I just need the data. I just need to know. But all of this data is literally kind of like a shaman throwing bones. Like, there's some truth in it. Like, you should do it, but you shouldn't become obsessed with it. I always tell people, if you have an attribution model that is like 70% accurate, you're fine. No need to dive deeper than that. Because what you're really trying to do is try to find you are trending in the positive direction. The model's still wrong, by the way. It's not accurate. But if the model's holding up to what reality is producing, then you have a good enough model. So attribution is one. The other thing is uh, KPIs. And this kind of goes in with attribution because if you are so obsessed with attribution, you will almost never do content marketing. You're only going to be doing direct response, like Facebook ads, funnels, that kind of stuff, which is fine. But that also means you are never going to have monstrous amounts of free traffic because free traffic is really hard to attribute. Like all of our SEO traffic that comes in from EF, for example, like we've done everything in terms of like trying to figure out like the best models to like track the attribution of that and it's just really really hard but if we were only focused on attribution we would not have more seo traffic than any other brokerage less marketplace in the entire industry right like that just would have never happened because we would have focused on ads that have a lot better ability to track the other thing is kpis so i was talking to key performance indicators right a lot of people use kpis and i think they're great but very similar to attribution, it's a model and models are wrong. Models are never right. So don't become like 
enslaved by the KPI. And a great story. So there was this company I was talking to about a collaboration. And the person was there that was that company's like affiliate manager. And they have very strong KPIs of sign up this many affiliates, get this many affiliates to produce this much. Well, I'm not an affiliate prospect, but we were talking and this is like him and I were talking about this collaboration we could do using our data and their data, create this huge industry report that would have been amazing for both sides. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I got to get on the next call because he has this KPI, right? So that company, because of their KPIs and being so strict about their KPIs, lost out on potentially tens of thousands of free visitors that our co-collaboration could have happened that could have converted into all of these customers because of this KPI. Like, I need to focus on the next referral partner. I need to focus on the next affiliate, right? So KPIs, again, very good, very good models, but you always need to approach everything in business, in my view, from a more holistic perspective. Like, if he got that win from me and was able to prove it, put it in his like folder of awesome or whatever, I'm sure his manager wouldn't have cared that much about the KPI, unless like the manager is stupid, I guess, because like the guy just created a bunch of revenue for the business, right? Which is the whole point <laughs> of working for the business, help create more revenue, right? So those are the two things like attribution KPIs, they get thrown around a lot, a lot of talk, a lot of rabbit holes, a lot of waste of time, a lot of the time. Mm. Well, I mean, tying back to a couple of things you said before, you know, you need to look at things a bit more holistically. I liked what you said about, you know, especially marketing tactics. There's, you can't overlook the basics. There's some tired and true principles within this sphere that have worked for decades or a generation for a reason. And so it's really easy to get overcomplicate things or get in the weeds of whatever the sexiest data is at the moment only to realize that you can't predict so much. I mean, if you were really to take a step back holistically, it's like, how predictable was the last two years? How is it predictable of a time period are we in currently? Not to say that distrust the entire system, but to make sure that in whatever you're doing, don't get lost, don't become enslaved to the wrong things like you said, and just make sure that you are seeing the whole picture versus kind of knuckling down on one small area and then realizing that you're just missing a better direction for the entirety of your business, probably yourself as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the funniest stuff I've done to help grow EF, if we were like super focused on attribution KPIs, I just wouldn't have been able to do like me accidentally buying a billboard in Thailand for like three months. (laughs) (laughs) It's tons of social media content for us from like digital nomads taking pictures of it. Like, oh my God, this really is the capital of the digital nomads. There's the Empire Flippers billboard, right? You know, stuff like that would have never been possible. Like all the buzz marketing stuff I like to do doesn't really lend itself well to attribution KPIs because it's literally just creating, you know, conversation. Right. You're missing more creative opportunities to kind of get out there and put your business out there. Well, Greg, this has been a lot of fun picking your brain on some of your favorite topics. I may have one last favorite topic to dig in with you before we get into some announcements. I did want to ask, Orca whales, are they really as cool as you think they are? <laughs> I saw this question of you and Lorna putting on the script. We might have to give the audience a bit of a background about orcas. Uh, <laughs> so for the audience, my favorite animal in the world is our orcas. And I am very obsessed with orcas and killer whales. I know a strange amount of knowledge about them. And to answer your question, absolutely. They are the best. <laughs> You know, we thought about this. I'm team humpback whales. And you did let me know that they're like, they're kind of, what is it, above orcas on the food chain? You know, they kind of run the sea. So I think my favorite animal beats your favorite animal. No way. Humpback whales are afraid of orcas. No, you told me that humpback whales will like kind of interfere if orcas are causing mayhem in the ocean. Well, humpback whales, they'll like, if it's a grown one and they have a baby, they're terrified of orcas. If they're an adult whale, they're usually not too put off. And like orcas will rarely attack an adult whale because it's just like so difficult. It's like a tail slap from the dorsal fin of whale could kill an orca, despite themselves being like amazing killing machines. Like they could take down a whale, but usually like it's not worth it. Like they're so good at hunting. Like why do we want to do this? Like they play around with great white sharks. (laughs) (laughs) Like like, they don't want to take on the humpback whale. Like great white sharks are easy prey for them. They're not going to do the whale. (laughs) That's fine. We can agree to disagree on our favorite animals duking it out (laughs) over kingship of the ocean. Well, Greg, as always, it's been super fun to have you back on. I did want to make a quick-ish announcement at the end of this. If you've loved having Greg on the Opportunity Podcast three times in a row, well, guess what? You are going to have him back on 
a little bit more from here on out, Greg will actually be taking over the podcast. Indeed, you're passing the torch to me from master to apprentice. Hopefully I will be able to continue on in your tradition. (laughs) I think you'll do a great (laughs) job. Please make sure to ask every single guest about orcas and then just see what happens. I am going to threaten to ruin the entire growth of this podcast by making every question I ask a digital entrepreneur I bring on just orca based. Like, so your Amazon (laughs) PPC, how is that related to the LA pod of the orca squad? Like, what does that look like? (laughs) Excuse me? (laughs) I'm not going to tell them I'm going to do this either. So I'll give them like a list of questions to help them prepare. And then it's just like, nope, all orcas. Sorry. See, and that's how stuff goes viral, is surprising them with uh, ocean mammal questions that people didn't expect. You came for business, you got something totally different, but you did learn. You might not have learned what you thought you were going to learn, but you learned something. How does one content (laughs) marketer help scale a business to eight figures using the Orca method? (laughs) (laughs) You think it's like some acronym for something? (laughs) (laughs) No, I think you're going to do an awesome job. I have absolutely loved hosting this podcast. It has been such a joy to do Wild Empire Flippers. You know, between that and kind of being on the content team, managing the content team, it's been a great adventure. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do with the podcast next. I think you're going to rock it and I will be tuning in um, and listening to where you take things. Yeah, I'm looking forward to having you on as you start your new business to talk about that as well. So you will be greatly missed. You're much better at radio than I am. So we'll see how I can do if I can fulfill your shoes. Well, if you do interview me, just know that I will not come with any answers about my business. I will only come with Orca answers to every business question you have. By the time you're hitting that scale in your business, I mean, the podcast will just become like an Orca podcast by that time. So cool, cool. So it'll be ready for it. It'll be the perfect fit for me by then. Thank you. Well, also in the tradition of the show, then I do have to make sure that you answer a couple rapid fire questions. Can't break tradition. So you're not getting out of this one. If you're cool with it, I'll start the first one off. Let's do it. All right. So what are the best hidden growth opportunities within digital marketing? The best hidden growth is almost always conversion rate optimization and building an audience. Ah, so this is not quick, but I will always tell people, if you want to make sure you're never in a bad place with your business, focus on building an audience over revenue. Like obviously you need profit, but if you can focus on building an audience, you'll never have to worry about revenue. You'll be able to spin up so many things from the audience. Awesome. Okay. Hey, that was actually fairly quick. I'm impressed. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Like long way to (laughs) curse. Well, no, you know what, to be honest, and if you listen to the podcast, people will know that we get to the rapid fire question section. And honestly, they're such big questions. They're really hard to make rapid fire. So it's cool. It doesn't the have slow to be. fire questions. The That's slow... I'm going to rename it the slow fire questions. <laughs> slow burn. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what tools or resources can people use to help market their online business? Yeah, I think the tool stack changes based on what you're doing. But I think one of the most foundational uh, things is market research for any kind of marketing you're doing. And I think SparkToro, it's owned by uh, Rand Fishkin, who who founded Moz back in the day, is a tool not a lot of people talk about, but it is super cool. I think if you want to learn niche better, the best thing to do is see what that niche is talking about. And SparkToro makes that super easy. Awesome. And final question, one that you've answered before, but maybe you'll have a different answer for this. What has been your funniest moment working within marketing? Oh my gosh. (laughs) There's so many moments. (laughs) I'm trying to think if there was a recent one that happened here, actually. I thought it was quite funny. Yeah, there was something that happened. Oh, so here's something that is funny that happened to me recently. I don't think I've talked about it on the podcast. So a few months ago, I was in Dubai speaking at Affiliate World, which is really cool. It's like a dream come true for me because like I really love that conference. I think some of the best marketers in the world go and speak to it. There I was speaking in front of like 7,000 entrepreneurs and my voice is completely blown from the night before. Like I was like out networking with these people forever to the early wee hours of morning. 
And so I wake up and my throat is just like constricted. And I have like an hour and a half before I have to give the speech, like the biggest speech I've ever given, <laughs> basically. It's Jeez. like the biggest audience. It's just like I'm croaking, you know. So I'm like, oh, no, I need to take a shower. So I like a hot shower. And I go there. The water is completely cold. Like, oh, my God, it's like <laughs> glaciers are attacking my skin. So I have to get out of this like miserable shower. Just like, well, at least I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go down to the lobby and order like this huge thing of green tea and I just start chugging it. It's like burning my throat, like work, work. <laughs> and so like the guys like message me, the conference organizer, like, hey, Greg, are you coming? Your speech is coming. I was like, yeah, you're just taking, <laughs> just taking care of this. I'm doing a delayed by my green tea. He's like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, don't worry about it. <laughs> and, uh, and so I walk over, I get up onto the stage and my voice is hoarse. I'm like, all right, I need to like, tell the audience something about my voice, like make light of it. Cause like, that's how I always handle these kind of situations, right? This was make a joke. And so I tell the audience, like you might notice my voice is very weak right now. And if your voice is not weak, like my voice, that means you're not taking this conference very serious. I was out all night networking with tons of people and you should have been too. If your voice <laughs> is like mine by tomorrow, then you did not do enough at this conference. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but just started laughing, you know. And I'm like, all right, good, covered it. I got it. <laughs> Did you get anybody who came up with like croaky voices the next day and was like, Greg, I took your advice or whatever that would sound like in a croaky voice? So this guy who runs a very big FBA community and then these two like Chilean millionaires came up to me after the speech because they really liked, you know, what I had to talk about. And their voice, all three of their voices were like my voice the next day because we all like went out uh, networking to like the different VIP events and stuff. So like I actually breakfast with the two Chileans because they were staying at my hotel and like, yeah, they definitely had some frogs in their throat. Like you did it. You got good value for your money. here. <laughs> you took my <laughs> advice. <laughs> I love that your advice is basically damage people's health and their, you know, their vocal oh, cords, yeah. it's despite terrible. it being temporary. So many of my digital entrepreneur friends are like obsessed with like, you know, Tim Ferriss style, optimize your life and everything. They have the aura rings like, like John, you know, our marketing ops manager. When I visited him in Dubai, you could just see all of his health charts on his like his iWatch and his aura ring, all the other stuff he uses, just like steep decline, like nosedive, like. <laughs> man, I am a terrible influence. But then I told him, like, look, man, I'm also a great influence because, like, all your charts are going to go way back up. You're going to have such huge gains you've never seen before in your health once I leave. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> your body will remember this. It will remember spending time with me. Be like, there is an effect. Memory, the moment I'm just around John, his aura rings start buzzing, like, you must leave. <laughs> Oh my gosh, don't get too caught up on the data to revisit some of your old advice. Don't listen to the attribution. <laughs> it's Greg, but not really Greg, but it's also still <laughs> Greg. That's super funny. Well, now that we know that you're good for marketing advice, bad for people's health, but still a joy to talk to, <laughs> I appreciate you coming on here again and sharing kind of what's going on with the industry and what you're seeing right now going on in marketing. I think this can be super handy for people who are looking to sort of get ready for all the crazy times coming up and be thinking about what their upcoming exit might look like. So thanks for sharing all your wisdom with us today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to helping giving people more good marketing advice on here while ruining their health and making them rich when they sell their business. So I think there's a headline in there somewhere. I'll use the AI tool to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> How to get rich, but also die kind of fast and slowly at the same time with Greg L. Frank. Technically, that means you're financially free sooner because you need less money because you live shorter, right? Yeah. <laughs> <So> it works. <laughs> None of us were getting out of life alive. You might as well uh, damage your health a little bit in a fun way with Greg. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome it's always a pleasure to be on here sarah yeah well thank you and best of luck taking over the podcast you are going to crush it can't wait to see what you do with it thank you i will do my best hey everyone thanks for tuning in i hope you've walked away with a bit of new insight that'll help you in your digital entrepreneurship journey if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To learn more about businesses available for sale at Empire Flippers, click the link in the description or visit empireflippers.com slash marketplace. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.